Praise the Lord, everybody. So praise the Lord, everybody. For a few seconds, close your eyes and lift your hands for a few moments. Father, speak to us because you're the only one that can speak. Father, say something to us that we have absolutely never heard before. We give you authority to come into this place and throw your weight around. Father, we didn't come into this place to play church games, but we came into this place because we have ground to conquer. So, Father, I thank you today we're about to conquer ground. Father, I thank you that we're about to make a forceful entry into a brand new element of our lives, and for that, we tell you thank you. Father, I thank you that you are about to allow us to see you in a way that we have never seen you before. And for that reason, we say thank you. Now, for a few minutes, open your mouth and just talk to him. Just for a few moments, just, just talk to him. And so let me give you some direction in the spirit. As you're talking to him, I want you to ask him to open up your eyes to the scripture. Because we are about to dive into a realm of revelation and insight. Tell him, Father, open my eyes to the scripture so that I can see you. Come on, talk to him for a few moments. Open my eyes so I may see you. So, Father, I pray on this people. Let the spirit of the Lord rest upon them. The spirit of wisdom and understanding. The spirit of counsel and might. The spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. Father, I pray like it unto Paul. I pray that the spirit of wisdom and the spirit of revelation sit on them. Come on, let me hear you pray. Don't get bored with it. Just for a few seconds. He's about to introduce himself to you in a brand new way today. Shout out to your pastors, Pastor Josh and Kim Hart. Would you shout out to them? Would you shout out to our chief apostle, Apostle Matthew L. Stevenson III? And let's go crazy for my pastor. Would y'all shout for Pastor Brandon Clack? Could y'all do that for me? It is so. Be seated. Um, I heard that you were a group of people that love the word of God. And so um, I'm going to switch over to this lapel if you don't mind. And because of that, uh, I want to explore some things in the scriptures with you. And we're going to walk through the scriptures and I'm going to unearth uh, some mysteries for you. Shout, it's a mystery. Uh, for so long, people have been trying to figure out the mystery of Christ. They have been trying to figure out who is this Christ? Where does this Christ come from? Where is he going? What is the purpose of Christ? And Christ is, in fact, not Jesus' last name, but is, in fact, his anointing. And so in the Old Testament, there were different types of Christ. Lean in, because we're going to go deep today. In the Old Testament, there were different types of Christ. You, you get the word Christos, which means anointed. So in the Old Testament, there were types of Christ, but they did not have the fullness of the anointing. So in the Old Testament, when you were anointed by oil, you were anointed as a prophet, you were anointed as a priest, or you were anointed as a king. So you only had a portion of it. And so when Jesus shows up, they're trying to figure out who this man really is. So he, he declares, I am the Christ. There, there is a nation of people that gets upset and they get extremely angry because surely this cannot be the Christ. The reason that this cannot be the Christ is because he's not meeting our expectation. They, they wanted Jesus to come somewhat like David. Matter of fact, 
Jesus said that David called him Lord, but he also said, I am the son of David, which caused much controversy because then they begin to say, how in the world are you the son of David, but David calls you Lord? You're not even old enough. You're only 34 years old. How in the world can you be his Lord and his son? Somebody shout, it's a mystery. And they've been trying to figure out this mystery forever. And so Paul kind of picks this mystery up. And as Paul is picking this mystery up, Paul begins in 1 Corinthians writing a letter to the Corinth church. There's so many different things going on in the Corinth church. We've all heard it. We've all heard that they were a gifted church. We all heard they were a gifted church that was dysfunctional. We've all heard that they were a gifted church that had problems. We all heard that they were a gifted church that, that dabbled in stuff that they wasn't supposed to dabble in because they were a group of people that were coming away from serving idol gods. But Paul, as he's writing to this church, he's also writing mysteries embedded in his letter. And I stumbled upon a mystery that I want to share with you today. I, I stumbled upon something that maybe we can explore together because it's something that I struggled with for a very long time because I wanted to understand Paul's temperament. I wanted to understand his tone. I wanted to understand why he thought the way he thought. He starts off the book of Corinthians by saying that the gift is the revelation of Jesus Christ. So he says the revelation of Jesus Christ is a gift. So you have to have this gift in order to understand him. But then he says in chapter two, he says it's spiritually discerned. He he says that no man is going to be able to understand a man unless it is spiritually discerned. You're not going to understand the things of God unless it's, it's spiritually discerned. And as he's writing in every chapter and every part. Now, something else that I want you to understand is that for just a few moments while we're talking today, let's eliminate chapter and verse because this is a letter that he's writing. So chapter and verse was put there so that we can comprehend it better. So we're going to extract chapter and verse for a few minutes but he's writing this letter and throughout the entire letter while he's giving a response to each and every person somehow he throws in but Christ and in and, and, and every situation, what, what, whether he's talking about people going to court, for some reason, Paul would deviate from what he's saying and he says, but it points back to Christ. It, it, it doesn't matter what Paul was talking about and everything that he was saying and everything that he was doing, he made it his business to say, but it's about Christ. Matter of fact, it's such, it's such a mystery. It's such a mystery that in Genesis, after God has finished creating man, he says a man shall leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife. And Paul picks that up. And as Paul is talking in Ephesians chapter five, he says the exact same thing. But then he says, I'm not even talking about marriage. This is about Christ in the church. As I'm reading the letters of Paul, I'm trying to understand, as I'm trying to understand Paul, what is it about this Christ that you were so infatuated with? What, what is it that you couldn't go a book, you couldn't go a sentence, you couldn't go a letter, you couldn't go a moment without unearthing Christ? He compared Christ to everything. He, he, he compared Christ to court. He compared Christ to marriage. And from the very beginning of Paul's writings, he always made it clear it's about one man. He, 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 he even says at the beginning of the letter in 1 Corinthians, he says, one waters, one plants, but it's God that brings the increase because it all points back to one man. Somebody shout, it's a mystery. And so I decided to pick a fight with ignorance today. And for that very reason, we're going to explore some revelation in the scriptures. Because as Paul is talking in the first nine chapters of 1 Corinthians, he begins to open up the mystery of Christ. But by the time he gets to the 10th chapter, 
he's no longer hinting about the mystery of Christ. He now becomes more aggressive about his approach. And then in the 10th chapter, he begins to explain and to express that Christ is the head of everything. Then we get to the 11th chapter and he feels the need to make it even more clear because there's an argument going on in the 10th chapter and the argument that's going on in the 10th chapter is that the man is covered by God but every woman needs a covering over their head and to this day there are women that's running around with coverings over their head because they feel like that that's the honorable, the honorable, thing, honorable thing to do but that is not what Paul is talking about because he says to have the covering over your head still is Christ. But he says, in order for you to discern, we're about to go there, in order for you to discern this, you need the spirit of Christ to discern it. Yeah. Yeah. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 11 because that's where this mystery begins to get very, very interesting. It gets very, very interesting um, because we have battled with this for years, but today, let's allow the Spirit of Christ to open our eyes to see this the way it was intended to be seen. Are y'all ready? Yes. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, and let's start at verse 23. And I'm going to walk you through this so that we can see this the way Paul seen it and not through our carnal mind. Verse 23, he says, for I have received of the Lord. Now, he's talking about, in the context, communion. And I didn't realize when the Lord was giving this to me that it's first Sunday, so this is normally when they do communion, so that's no pun intended, it just so happened to work out like that. But he's talking about the context of communion. And as he's talking about the context of communion, he's, he's frustrated because these people are taking communion and they have no understanding of the purpose of it. They have no clarity of it. And he says, I'm not going to praise you because you're doing this wrong. He says, there are often some among you that speak heresy, which means that they're talking crazy about the reason that communion is supposed to be taken. Look at what he says. He says, verse 23, for I have received of the Lord, meaning that I have received this revelation from the Lord. So he begins to go into a revelation and look what he says. For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you. So there is a revelation that I got that now I'm about to give to you. Look what he says. He says, I have delivered it unto you that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. All right? We've all heard it. Let's look at it different. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of who? Me. Who is the me? Christ. Pay attention, y'all, because it's about to get interesting. Look what he says in, in, in the next verse. He says, after the same manner, what same manner? What same manner is he talking about? He says, after the same manner, he took the cup. Because why? He's pointing it back to him. Look what he says. He says, after the same manner, also he took the cup. And when he had supped, saying, this cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as often as you drink it in remembrance of? Okay. Now, let's, un let's, 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 let's unlock this mystery because I had a problem with this for a very long time. And the reason that I had a problem with this for a very long time is because when we approached communion, we approached it as though it was a funeral. But communion was never designed to be a funeral. It was designed to be a revelation. It was designed to be a celebration. 
but for some reason it has been interpreted as a funeral. So we come and they put the white sheet over the front of the table and everything is spooky and everything is weird and everything is strange and you can't touch it unless you first repent of your sins. Am I lying? But that's not what Paul said. Y'all don't believe me. Look at verse 27. I'm going to show you something. Look at verse 27. Look what he says. He says, wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. Stop. I got a problem here because right here he's saying nothing about your sin. Lean in. It's going to get uncomfortable. So just lean in right here. He's saying nothing about your sin. Right here, he says, if you drink it unworthily, you shall be guilty of the body and the blood. Now, we have to ask the question. Somebody asked, what does it mean unworthily? What does it mean? Now, pay attention here. He says in the beginning that when you take this, when you drink of my blood and you eat of my flesh, it means to remember so when he says that you're doing it unworthily, it means that you're thinking of your sin. Lean in, lean in. I feel like I lost you. I feel like, I, I, I really feel like I lost you. See, when, when you're unworthy, you start to think about the things that you've done. Come here for just a second. Come, 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 come here for just a second. Come. He, he, says, he says you're doing it unworthily because what's happening is when I take of the communion, I'm supposed to remember him. But what's happening is I'm remembering what happened before him. And he says, that's what's making you unworthy. But check what he says in it. Check what he says. He says, you are guilty of the body and blood. What does it mean for you to be guilty of it? It means that you are in need of it. So I take communion because I do have a problem. I don't fix my problem in order to commune. Are y'all understanding what I'm saying? So, so he says, when I take of it, for some reason, I'm unworthy because I keep going back to the thing I did wrong. And he says, now you're taking it Unworthily, y'all, y'all sit down now, cause, cause we gotta unlock this. We gotta unlock this, cause look what he says in the next verse, verse twenty-eight. Look what he says. He says, "But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup." I'm examining myself. Pay attention to the context. I'm examining myself because I have a problem. And he says, so let a man examine himself and so let him take, eat and drink. I take, eat and drink because I realized I slept with somebody I wasn't supposed to. No, communion wasn't spooky. It was a celebration. Now, okay. Let's break this down. Let's, let's, let's break this down so we can have an understanding of this. Now, you have to understand what Paul is talking about right here. Do anybody understand what Paul is talking about right here? Okay, somebody shout, explain it then. He's talking about Passover. And so what's happening at Passover is that at Passover, they will take a lamb and they will kill it because they were celebrating the fact that they came out of slavery. Pay attention here. They were celebrating the fact that they came out of slavery. And as they were coming out of slavery, what they would do was they would have this thing called Passover to celebrate the fact that they were no longer slaves to what? Paul says in Romans that we were slaves to the law. Pay attention here. So they're celebrating this Passover by killing the lamb. And when they kill the lamb, they have something called seven days of unleavened bread. 
Are you following me? So they have seven days of unleavened bread and they will eat unleavened bread for seven days. And as they're eating the unleavened bread for seven days, the purpose of the killing of the lamb was so that death could pass over. So they will eat the bread of, uh, they will eat the unleavened bread for seven days as an indication that death was passing over because death was supposed to snatch the first son. Pay attention. Passover was the first feast. Paul says at the beginning of the chapter that Christ is the head of all men. So the reason that he has Passover at the beginning, he called, matter of fact, go to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. I need you to see it. I, 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 I need you to see it for yourself So, because I, I don't want you to call me crass. I, I, I want you to see it. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Let's look at verse 7. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7. Look what it says. It says, Purge out therefore the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened, for even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Verse 8. Therefore, let us what? Let us what? So, Let's, let's go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 11 because he says, do this in remembrance of me. So death was supposed to pass over and they were supposed to eat the unleavened bread for seven days so death will pass over them. So Paul, in context, is talking about Passover and the feast of the unleavened bread. Pay attention here. Because then he says in verse 29, pay attention to what he says in verse 29. He says, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 29. Am I going too fast? Are y'all getting this? Okay, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 29. He says, watch this. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh judgment to himself. Some of your Bibles might say damnation. That word damnation is the word judgment. He says, drinketh judgment to himself, pay attention, not discerning the Lord's body. D d am I the only one that read that or did we just mess that up for years? N not, not discerning the Lord's body. The judgment is because I wasn't discerning the purpose that I was taking it. He says, he says not to, so what, what, what does it mean to discern? What does it mean to discern? It means to see in the spirit and put a distinguishment between the two. Meaning that I need to be able to look to see whenever there's a loaf where the unleavened or where the leavened is in the unleavened. Which means, now pay attention here. What is the leaven? Remember Jesus said to the disciples, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. What was the leaven of the Pharisees? The doctrine of the Pharisees. What was the doctrine of the Pharisees? The law. God, dog, they missed it. Let's do it again, Jeremiah. Now, pay attention here. Remember, he's doing this because they're celebrating coming out of slavery. Paul says in Romans, we was a slave to the law. Now, did it just connect for you? Y'all want to go deeper? So he says, he says, not discerning the Lord's body. Uh, that, that, that word diakino, discerning, not, not discerning the Lord's body, not, not, not being able to understand the purpose by which he died. The, the, the thing that you have to understand is that Jesus' death was not an event. To Paul, he's trying to get us to understand that Jesus' death is a reality. And he's saying, y'all are coming together, eating this feast like it's an event. But you don't realize this is a reality that the man really did die. He really did get up. Look, 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 look what it says. It says, not discerning the Lord's body. Verse 30, watch this, 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 this verse. This verse has complicated us for a long time. You ready? Look at verse 30. He says, 
For this cause, many are weak, sickly among you, and many are dead. But why? That doesn't make sense to me. But why? Because if you don't understand the context of Passover, you won't understand why many are weak, why many are sick, and why many are dead. The reason that they are weak, the reason that they are sick, and the reason that they are dead is because they were not keeping the feast. According to Passover, God told them in Exodus chapter 12 that if you don't keep the feast, you will die. 1215, I believe it is. Uh, he says, if you don't keep the feast, you will die. And so when we tell people, my God, I feel like going here. I don't want to, but I feel like doing it. When we tell people that they cannot take communion because they are in sin, you just stop them from partaking in the feast. Let me ask you a question. Let's be honest. Let's be honest. How many of you took communion knowing you was in sin? Are you dead? Are you sick? Are you weak? But you kept showing up to church. Why? Because you were able to discern. I need this thing called church. I don't know. I don't know what to do. I, I, I need this thing called church. I don't care what nobody else is doing. I had the ability to discern the Lord's body because I need it. I am a wretch under. I need it. I struggle, but I need it. I, okay, let me get out of that. All right, let's, let's deal with the text. Let's, let's deal with the text. Let's deal with the text. We got to deal with the text. He says, he says for, for this cause, what was the cause? that they were not discerning the Lord's body. Verse 31, verse 31, look what it says. It says, for if we judge ourselves, now, let's read the text the way it's supposed to be read because that word judge is the same word in verse 29 that is discerning. Diakrino, it's the Greek word diakrino. So the sentence says, pay attention, for if we would discern ourselves, we should not be judged. Why? Because I realize that there's some law still in me. And because I realize there's some law still in me, that is cause for me to go and eat the bread and drink of the cup because law is still in me. So that is the cause of communion. So communion wasn't a first Sunday thing. Communion was a daily thing, as Paul said in Hebrews, to cleanse the consciousness from wickedness and dead works and evil mindsets. He says, I've got to purge the mindset. Why? Because you're worthy of it. Yeah. Touch somebody next to you and say, I'm worthy. That was too weak for me. I said, touch somebody and say, I'm worthy. Stop playing church games with me. I said, touch somebody and say, I'm worthy. I know you know what I did, but I'm worthy. I know you know where I've been, but I'm worthy. I know you heard what I said, but I'm worthy. I know you saw what I posted on Facebook, but I'm worthy. That's, that's the cause of it. Let's, you want to go further? Yeah. Let's go further. He says, verse 32, but when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord that we should not be condemned with the world. So when I deem myself unworthy, I'm chastened by the Lord. I want you to see it because I don't want you to call me Christ. That word chastened right there is the word padio, which means to be educated where we get the phrase, train up a child. We're about to make some connections here. 
So he says, when you are judged, the Lord himself educates you to remind you, I died for you. Come, 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 come here right quick. Come, 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 come again. Come, come again. Come again. Come again. This, 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 this is, this is the cross. This is the cross. And so what happens is, walk with me. We find ourselves looking behind the cross because of what we did rather than, come here, stand behind him. Standing behind the cross and looking at him. And when I look at him, I can't see him. I can only see the cross. So I think, I'm about to show y'all something so amazing in the scriptures. Are y'all ready for me? Y'all ready? When, 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 I, when I see him, he educates me. When I see Christ, he tells me how worthy I am. So I no longer see me do this as often as you remember so if I'm remembering myself and not remembering Christ, I'm not taking communion, I'm taking damnation. Thank you, gentlemen. Right, it, is this making sense? Okay, let's, let's, let's go further. Let's go further. Verse 33. Verse 33. This making sense? Y'all sure? Okay, verse, ver, verse 33. He says, wherefore, my brethren, when you come together, tarry one for another. Why? We, we were taught to tarry for the Holy Ghost. Yeah. I'm going to show you something about that too in a minute. But he says right here, tarry one for another. Why? Because that word tarry means to wait. So he says, when you come together, when it's regarding this communion, wait on one another. What are we waiting on? For them to get the same revelation that you got. I got a revelation of the cross. So that does not make me impatient with your lack of revelation of it. No, lean in, because this is a generation that loves to cut people off and tell people, I ain't got time, I ain't waiting on you, you're, you're going to have to pay for my time, and all that. How wicked can you be? The devil is a lie. Wait! Means to give them your time. Maybe they don't got it like you got it. Maybe they don't see it the way you see it. So he says, when you come together, Terry. One for the other. Now, let's, let's go further in this. Let's, verse 34. And if any man hunger, dang, I wish I had time to break that down. Let him eat at home that ye come not together unto condemnation. And the rest I will set in order when I come. They made that seem like God was talking and that's Paul talking. Anyway, I'll leave that alone. But the fact of the matter is, when you're reading it, he says, Eat at home. <laughs> we come together for revelation. Help me, Jesus. We're not coming together to put no white sheet on the table. We're coming together to get an understanding of the reason I'm still here. Eat at home. I did something to y'all. Uh, because I consider myself a skilled theologian. And so I did something to you all on purpose. And uh, I'm sorry that you didn't catch it, so I apologize. And uh, I'm going to correct my mistake. I did, I did something to you all. I did it intentionally, uh, but I didn't do it with the intent to harm. I did it with the intent to educate. What I did was I skipped over a verse. <laughs> I, 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 I skipped over a verse. I, I skipped over this verse because if I didn't explain the other verses, you wouldn't understand 
this verse. Look at verse 26. Look, look, look at verse 26. I, I, I skipped over it. Those of you that's watching at home, take your notes. I'm so sorry that I skipped over this verse. I'm going to do you good right now. Check it. He says, for as often as you eat this bread <laughs> and drink this cup, some versions say you do show, some say you announce, some say you declare, All right? The Lord's death till he comes. Got a problem with that. Somebody asked me what? Because they made it seem like, not us, all nations were educated. They made it seem like till he comes means till he return. They made it seem real rapture-y. They, they, they made it seem like when he returns in the last day. But that word come right there is the word akrama, which means to come to a company, to come to grow, to come to establish. Okay, you, you don't understand why that's so important. You don't, you, you, you don't understand why that's important, do you? You don't understand why that's important. There's a pattern happening right here. Can I invite you into a mystery? Do you want to go with me? Let's go. He says in verse 23 and in 24, he's given us evidence of Passover. Verse 25, he's given us the evidence in the revelation of Passover. But in verse 26, he says, do this until I come to accompany you. You don't understand why that's important. Let me try it one more time. Oh, that's probably what it is. Let me explain. After Passover, 50 days afterwards, we have something called Pentecost. Lean in. Right here, he's given us evidence of Pentecost because he's saying, do this until I come. Did we not hear that before? Remember Jesus after he gave bread? He said, go to Jerusalem and wait, he says, and tarry there until you are endued with power which the Holy Ghost will come upon you. Now, I'm about, can, can I invite you into a deeper mystery? All right, th th this is going to give you a shock, but I want to invite you into a deeper mystery. The purpose of the Holy Ghost was not for us to cast out devils. Lean in, lean in. The purpose of the Holy Ghost was not for us to lay hands on the sick. That's what authority is for. Somebody shout, prove it. Because the disciples and all before did it without the Holy Ghost. They did it with authority. And the authority was his name. But what was the purpose of the Holy Ghost? I didn't give y'all this verse, but go to Acts 1 and 8. Because we got to read, we got to read the Bible. And, 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 and when you read it, you got to really read the Bible. Go to Acts 1 and 8. I'm about to show it to you. Acts 1 and 8. Somebody shout, it's a mystery. <laughs> now, Acts 1 and 8. Y'all ready? Yes. Look what it says. But ye shall receive after the... Does what? And ye shall be... So the purpose of the Holy Ghost was to have power to witness. Pay attention here. What are we witnessing? Revelation says the testimony of Jesus Christ is the spirit of prophecy. So I'm witnessing in power the testimony of Jesus Christ. 
What is the testimony of Jesus Christ? I was dead, Revelation chapter one. I know y'all think Revelation is a book about the end time, but that's a whole nother testimony for a whole nother day. I was dead, but now I am alive. That was the testimony of Jesus Christ. So when the Holy Ghost come upon you, you will have power to prophesy and testify about Jesus Christ. Why? Because every gift points back. Not only is that so powerful, you want to know what else is so powerful? Paul is giving us that mystery in chapter 11. You won't believe what chapter 12 is about. Chapter 12 is about the gifts of the Spirit. He then, but, but look how he starts it off. He starts it off by saying, now concerning spiritual gifts. Why? Because now, after I have done communion, the Holy Spirit has come upon me and now I can move in the Spirit. But he says, in order for you to understand the mystery of the Spirit, I got to deal with the mystery of ignorance. I got to let you know what the Spirit is not. Can we go deeper? Let's go to chapter 12 real quick. All right, chapter 12, I don't, I don't want to labor too long in chapter 12 because we all know, we all know chapter 12, right? We, we all know chapter 12. But look, look at verse 2 real quick. We, we, all, we, all, we all know chapter 12. Look, look at verse 2. He says, ye know that you were Gentiles carried away unto these, what does it say? Unto these what? Notice, notice my beloved brothers and sisters, I invite you into a place called mystery. Notice he did not say dead idols because to some, they are moving under the power of idols that don't talk to them. But he says, concerning these dumb idols, meaning these idols that do not speak. Why? Because the blood speaks better things than Abel. So the blood speaks. But he says, I want you to understand that you were Gentiles, carried away, led by idols that didn't speak to you. Look at verse 3. Wherefore I give unto you understanding that no man speaketh by the Spirit of God calleth Jesus Christ a curse, and that no man can say that Jesus is the Lord but by the Holy Ghost. So he says, do this until I come. Am I boring, y'all? He says, do this until I come, and when he comes, the Holy Ghost sits on you, and then you have power to be his witnesses. Then in chapter 12, he's telling us that no man speaks about the Holy Ghost except that they have the spirit of Jesus Christ. So, so we know, I, I wish I had time to break, break open chapter 12. Chapter 12 is full of revelation and mystery. But, but, but let me give you a synoptics of it real quick. The beginning part of chapter 12, he says there is one spirit. He begins to tell us that there is one God. There is one spirit. There is one body. And then at the ending part of chapter 12, he begins to tell us, now we are members of that one body. Because through the gifts, you can either be a gift to a person or you can be a body to a person. It depends on what that person needs. Why? Because it all goes back to one God, one spirit. But then I want to introduce you to a mystery. After he's done expressing to us about these gifts, at the end of it, in verse 31, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 31, he says, but covet the best gifts. Everybody says, and I show unto you a more excellent way, a more weightier matter. Chapter 13, we all knew that it was a book about love. 
And so forever, we, we, we went through it. Y'all want to read those verses real quick just so it can be on your, or, or your look, look, look at chapter 13, verse 1. Verse 1. He says, though I speak with tongues and of men and of angels and have not love, I become a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And we've, we've, we've all heard that. All right, cool. Ch uh, ver verse 2. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not love, I am nothing. Thank you, Paul. Verse three, and though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not love, it profits me nothing. So if I don't have love, it doesn't profit nothing. Now, pay attention, verse four, uh, love suffers long. Now, now he's about to tell us, he's, he, he's about to tell us what love is. And then I'm going to introduce you to something that's going to really help you understand the purpose of this love wall. He says, uh, love suffers long and is kind. Love envies not. Uh, jump to verse five. We read it. Verse five. Do, do not behave selfishly, unseemly, uh, seeking not, uh, seek not her, uh, her own, nor easily provoke, uh, think no evil, rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in truth. Verse seven. Love bears all things. Love believes all things. Love hopes all things. Love endures all things. Verse eight. Love never fails. Okay. Now, pay attention. He says, love never fails. Okay, pay attention, pay attention. Love never fails. All right, pay attention, pay attention. Love never fails. You're not getting it. See, when you hear me say love, you're hearing me say affection. But he's not talking about affection. Just, just read it. Just, just, just take a second and just look at it. Just, just, just look at it. Just glance over it for a few seconds. Let, 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 let's go to school for just a few minutes. Just glance over it for a few seconds. Just glance, glance. Just go, glance. Look, look at those verses. Love, love. Look, 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 look what love is doing. Just look, just look, just look. Look at it. You, you, you see it? Put a pin in that. Because I'm going to show you a mystery. Then we're going to go back to why Paul was saying that. I, I, I know we, we, we put that in our houses as poems and we put it in our cute little Easter speeches and all of that and I know that we like to put it on our wall and I know that we like to say it at our weddings but pa Paul is trying to give us a mystery here. But, but, but look what he says in verse 8. Love never fails. But whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. Now, does he say anything about false prophets right there? He says nothing about false prophets right there. But we have seen prophetic words fail, right? Yeah. And we call the person a false prophet. Yeah. But Paul is trying to give us a mystery that something is missing within that voice. Pay attention, I'm setting you up for something. He's trying to give us a mystery that something is missing within the voice. But we think it's just pure love and pure affection. Look at what he says, verse nine. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. Oh yeah, that's good. We love that, we love that, we love that. Yeah, I don't know everything. I ain't good at everything. I only know a little what the Lord showed me. The Lord only showed me a little bit. But that's ignorant. Go to verse 10. But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part should be done away with. No, lean in, lean in. It's right there in the Bible. I didn't make it up. I didn't fabricate it. It's right there. He says, but that which is perfect when it has come. What have we been talking about coming all this time? When it has come, then that which is done in part has been done away with. Let, let, let's go further. Let's go further. Let, let me tell you why. Let's go further. Verse 11. Verse 11, let's go further. Ver, ver, verse 11, look what it says. He says, when I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. What is he saying? When I was a child, I spoke in part. 
I prophesied in part. I did miracles in part. But when I became a man, I did away childish things. And no longer are we going to be like the Old Testament where there's just a part of Christ. We're going to be like the New Testament where there is the fullness of Christ. Y'all want to go further? Oh, I got to hurry up. I got a few minutes. Let me hurry up. Now look, 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 look what he says. Verse, verse 12. For we see through a glass darkly. Now, that word glass is the word mirror. He says, for we see in a mirror darkly because when I look through the mirror, which the mirror in James chapter 1, I believe it's verse 23, represents the word of God. He says, when I look through the mirror, I'm really looking through the word of God. And when I'm looking through the word of God, I have to see Jesus. Now, what does a mirror do? A mirror reflects you. But he's telling us the mystery of a mirror that is not supposed to reflect you, it's supposed to reflect Christ. Has that not what he's been talking about since chapter 11? So he says, when I look through the word, I don't look through the word to find me. I look through the word to find Jesus to fix me. Let's go a little bit further. He says, but face to face. Why face to face? Face to face means Christ. Okay? Now look, look, look at the next clause. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even also as I am known. He says, as I'm looking through the word, I know in part, but as I keep looking through Christ, I begin to know all things. Verse, verse, verse 13, verse 13, verse 13, and then I'm done. Verse 13, and now abide us. Faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Why does he say the greatest of these is love? Why? I, I, want, you, I want you to look at the text before I open it up for you. Just, I, I, I just want to invite you into the mind of Christ. He says, But the greatest of these is love. Faith, hope, and love. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. Flesh, are, are, are you ready? Flesh, that was the word. Or let me say it the way the Bible says, the word made flesh was everything unseen. The word made flesh was everything we hoped for. We had been hoping for a Christ. We had been hoping for a savior. But he says, the greatest of these is love. Why? Because as he was talking to the disciples, he says to them, there is no greater love than this, that a man will lay down his life and die. Then he says, because of this, I no longer call you disciples. I now call you friends. For disciples only know in part but friends knows all. And so the reason he's telling us in chapter 13 about this love, go to Colossians, my last verse, and then I'm done. Colossians chapter three, because you're going to see the reason 
he gives us this breakdown of love is because look at, look at this, Colossians chapter 3, look at verse 9. Lie not one to another, seeing that you have put off the old man with his deeds and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. Verse 11, when there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, go to verse 12, Put on, therefore, listen, listen to what he says. He says, put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved bowels of mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness and long suffering. Did we just not read that in chapter, 12, uh, chapter 13? But look what he says. Forbearing one another, verse 13, forbearing one another, forgiving one another. If any man has quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. Now look at verse 14. And above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfectness. So Paul tells us that love, you can play, is a garment. He says, put, put, put on this garment. Because because once you have the garment on, you can move in perfectness. So I look at everything. Paul is trying to get us to look at everything through his death. Paul is trying to get us to really understand Christ's death. Notice in Paul's writings, he never really talks about the life of Jesus outside of the death. That's why he opens up 1 Corinthians and says, I don't want to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. So he says, in no uncertain terms, I want you to know everything through his death because everything is redeemable. Everything, everybody, everywhere, it's redeemable. I don't care if they're homosexual. I don't care if they're a lesbian. I don't care if they're on drugs. I don't care if they're crazy. I don't care. I don't care if it's not a part of the local church assembly. It's redeemable. It's redeemable. Everything is redeemable. Everybody is redeemable. And Paul is saying, you got to stop throwing people away. You got to stop throwing communities away. You got to stop throwing ideas away. You got to stop throwing stuff away because everything is redeemable. But you will never know it if you don't put on this garment called love. I want to do something different this morning. I want to, I'm going to invite you to the altar. I want to invite you to the altar for those of you that, that are ready to make a commitment, not of salvation. I don't want to talk about that. To make a commitment to take on the responsibility to redeem all men. If, if, if you're going to take that Responsibility, meet me down here. Prophet, I'm going to take that responsibility to redeem all men, to redeem everything, to redeem everybody. No, I ain't going to play church no more. I love you. I don't have time talking about you. I don't have time trying to play games with you. I don't have time pretending. I don't have time doing none of that. I going to take the responsibility to redeem. I understand they crazy, they cuss, I understand they gay, they struggle, they got medicine, I understand that they got problems, but I'm a life-giving spirit. I'm called to redeem. I'm called to redeem. I'm called to redeem. I'm called to redeem. I'm taking the responsibility to redeem. I'm, 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 I'm going to go back home and redeem my children. I'm going to go to school and redeem the system. I'm, I'm going to go into my community and redeem it. Matter of fact, after church, this coming week, I'm going to go to City Hall, walk around and redeem it. I'm, 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 I'm called to redeem. I'm called, 
I'm, I'm called to redeem. And so all nation south, I was sent here this morning to get you to respond to the call of action to redeem. Those of you that's down here that's making that commitment, lift your hands. Lift your hands. And uh, I want to come and just, you ain't got to fall and all that. But I, I want to come and just touch you. If you feel the power of God and fall, that's your own recognizance. But the power is not in the fall. The power is in the impartation. And I just want to slightly just lay hands on you so that the eyes of your understanding may be enlightened. Paul says, Paul says, I pray that the eyes of your understanding are enlightened. And so the same way that the Lord has opened up the scriptures to me, there were so many different things that I want to show you, so many different scriptures, and I didn't get a chance to get to them, but it's all right. But there was a point that Jesus was walking with the disciples and they were complaining and they did not recognize it was Jesus. But the moment that the Bible says Jesus took the bread and broke it, the Bible says, and their eyes were open. And they said, did our hearts not burn within us? As he opened the scriptures to us. And so today the scriptures have been opened to you so that you can receive your assignment to redeem. And so I'm just gonna lay hands on you. And I'm going to pray that the eyes of your understanding are enlightened so you can discern your assignment. Father, open our eyes. Mm. <laughs> Ooh, something new is coming on you. Receive that. Receive your assignment. Receive your assignment. Receive your assignment. Something new is coming on you. Receive that. Receive your assignment. Something new. Receive your assignment. Something new. Something new coming on you. I'm going to pull you and it's going to be a spiritual indication that you will come out of that desolate place where water will begin to flow in your life again. When I see you, I see you in a desert. But come out in the name of Jesus. Come out. And from this day forth, water will flow in your life. Receive your assignment. Receive. Give it to her. Receive your assignment. Receive your assignment. Father, you've opened up the scriptures to me. Now do it for her. Give her her desire. Come deeper. Come deeper. It's okay to be deep. It's okay. It's okay to understand mysteries and revelation. No longer would you hold back. I see in the spirit, there's a muzzle that's been over your mouth. There's this muzzle over you. That mask you're wearing is a representation of your real life. It's a muzzle over you. Scared to speak, scared to declare, scared to say. but receive your assignment. <laughs> Father, give this prophet what belongs to her. Give this prophet what belongs to her. Give it to her. I'm putting a burden on you. God is going to burden you for cities. City council is calling you. It's time for you to make decisions. God is about to cause you to make decisions. Father, give it. 
what belongs to her. So now I call you into your assignment. Call you into your assignment. Ladies. Call you into your assignment. Call you into your assignment. You shall receive it. Receive your assignment. Call you into your assignment. Receive your assignment. I call you into your assignment. Receive your assignment. I call you into your assignment. There's a time of miracles that's about to rest on you. Uh, I, I see you, you, you've, been, you've been waiting on God to do miraculous, like, uh, like old time miraculous things. There is something supernatural you have seen and you desire to see it again. God told me to tell you, he's going to let you see it again. I, I don't know what this is that you've seen before. You've seen something real miraculous. Uh, you've seen something real miraculous. And you've gotten comfortable, but you've secretly desired to see something miraculous. <sighs> Give it to her, God. Give it to her. He's going to let you see the miraculous again. Yes. Yes. There is a, there is a lament that has been on you to see supernatural things and it's coming again it's coming again father give her her assignment give her the burden of it in the name of Jesus you see your hands father I thank you that you're putting the burden on her to redeem now empower her in the name of Jesus father I thank you There is an influence coming to you. Uh, and this influence is going to come to you uh, from the south. The Spirit of the Lord is going to do something in southern states for you. And you're going to have influence in southern states. I see you traveling to the south. The Spirit of the Lord is going to send you to the south to complete many assignments. Father, put the assignment on her. And let her not be afraid to accomplish what you're calling her to do. God is going to do something in you that is going to totally take you out of your comfort zone. It's going to totally take you out of what you're used to, your norm. It, it's, it's not even going to match your personality. It's not going to look nothing like you. But the Lord is going to use your mouth to make unusual decisions. God is going to give you influence with like politicians in the South. You're, you're going to make, you're, you're, it's, it's almost, and, and this is going to sound so cliche, and I hate cliche type, but it's almost like, kind of like a DeBoer type of thing, but it's going to be greater than that, because you're going to have the hearts of great influencers in the South, and they're going to come to you like a mother figure, and they're going to ask you questions and inquire of your wisdom, and the Spirit of the Lord is going to give you word of knowledge to know the secrets of their hearts so that they won't get on the wrong paths. Prepare yourself, because it's not going to be your norm, but it's going to become your norm. God say he's putting another gift on you. Uh, there is a desire to hear and to see, but in a different realm. God is about to open up your eyes because you're about to make an exit. You're about to leave one element and you're about to aggressively approach another. Supernatural things is coming. Father, do it. I'm doing this 
is you're going to shake hands with many businessmen. And not necessarily to go into business, but to advise them. God is going to give you a wisdom for economies. There is a wisdom of economies coming on you. Like and unto Joseph, you're going to be able to save a nation. Watch what I tell you. Father, give him what he needs and put the burden on him. Put that burden on him. Put that burden on him. Put the burden on him. There is a revolution coming. And it is a revolution of people who are in love with the scriptures. You will be a part of that revolution. God is going to hijack your heart and make you hungry to know him through the word. Like it into how I uh, travel through the scriptures, the Lord is going to put that same thing on you. Thank you. And I thank you. Burden him. Burden him to redeem men. Father, I thank you. But you're going to burden him to redeem men. Father, I thank you. He's going to make it easy for you. That which you pursue. Um, so let me have prophetic integrity and then I'll prophesy. So we talked about some stuff in the car that you were going to do. And you talked about where you were going to move. But when I just touched you, the spirit of the Lord told me that he's going to send you to Atlanta. God's going to send you to Atlanta to do business in Atlanta. And this is going to seem really, really weird, but he's also going to send you to Utah to do business there. He's going, I heard that. He's going to send you to places that the normal black people do not go to because that is one of your desires. You don't want to get tra trapped into black culture. Now, did we talk about that in the car? Oh, I thought you rode with me. Who, who was that that rode with me? That was the other one? Okay, but you're not gonna get trapped into black culture. Y'all look alike. You're not gonna get trapped into black culture. God is going to send you places that the norm does not go. God is going to send you places that the average is not at. So that you can, so there, there, is, there is going to be uh, many dreams and goals that you have and it's not going to be uh, trapped within someone already, already done it here. Someone already established it here. We've already seen this before. We've already established this before. God is going to cause you to take ideas to places that no one else is. He's going to almost send you to like desert places to create water. Father, put it on him. In Jesus' name. Put it on him. Make it easy in Jesus' name. Father. Oh, that was you I rolled with. Who, why y'all all look alike? Where's the, who, where the guy roll with? He left. They all look alike. I guess they see all black people do look alike. <laughs> Thank you. Father, hijack her entire life. And put the word of the Lord in her mouth. burden her with the ability to snatch men out of the fire. Let me hold your hands for a moment. You are not going to be afraid to be who God called you to be. God is going to put so many gifts and talents in you and he's going to cause them to come forth. All of this creativity that's locked up in you is about to burst forth all at once. 
I, I, when, when I hold your hands, I see your hands doing multiple things, like you have multiple sets of hands because you're going to be doing multiple things at one time. So many ideas, so many goals, so many dreams, and this frustration of what to pursue first, God said, pursue it all and I'll prosper it all. You don't have to pick what you choose to pursue. He's going to allow you to do it all. Father, give her the strength to do it. And I speak to that procrastination. That now you will have the strength to do it. You'll have many late nights after tonight. Many, many late nights. Writing, drawing, pursuing. You'll have many late nights. It is so. I pray for you. Who else I'm praying for? I'm praying for you. Father, burden her. Burden her. With the ability to redeem men. Jesus. Name. Said everybody. Come. Father, burden. Hmm. Hmm. Father, burden him. The ability to redeem men. And let what his hand so touch prosper. You, you, you've been uprooted and planted so many times. And the spirit of the Lord is about to create a stability in you to prosper in the places that you want to go. I've been trying to figure out, am I going to prosper here, prosper there, prosper here, prosper there, prosper there. But you're, you're not going to have that fight after today. You're about to discern your place. And you're going to prosper. It is so. Whole Nation South, thank you all so much for allowing me to minister to you. Come. All the burden him the ability to do unusual things. Do me a favor. Father, I call him into dreams and visions. I call him to see and say. Allow him to establish your plan in the earth. Allow him to know your intent. Share your hearts and your secrets with him. In Jesus' name. Oh, nations, thank you so much for allowing me to minister to you. And um, thank you uh, for receiving me. I really appreciate it. There are times where certain prophetic voices are thrown into a generation, thrown into in front of a people. There are certain times where God decides to say, this voice will be a voice that I will use to amplify what I will do next. There are voices that speak consecutively to what God will do next. God is about to continuously show you his plans. You are not one that do not like to know what's going on. You like to know what's next. And God is about to show you what's next. Now here is the thing. You are going to even get so frustrated because even watching brand new movies, you're going to know the ending before the end, while you're in the beginning. You're, you're just going to know. God is going to put a grace on you just to know the end of things. You're, you're, you're going to get bored with a whole lot of just carnal stuff because you're just going to know the end already because God is going to allow your spirit to constantly see the end. You're going, you're going to be able to discern Paul within Saul's. You're, you're going to be able to pull that out. Wait, wait, I, I, I see something in them, though. 
And, and there are going to come times that there are going to be people that want to throw other people away, but you are going to be their rescuer. You have a desire to turn trash into treasure. It's hard for you to even throw stuff away because you feel like it's useful and I can, I can use this for something. I can do something with this. That's because of what you were designed to do. Your hardware says, I just can't throw things away. And so it's going to be difficult for you because you're going to face a lot of hurt because you're not going to know how to let go. And you've been like that your whole life. You don't know how to let go. And people come and they stump on your heart and people come and they take from you and people come and they use you. And, and, and I, I can hear in the spirit now, it, it, family, just leave them alone. Just stop, let it go, move on. But for some reason, you just can't. It, 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 you just can't. But God is going to help you. The, the courage of that is you're going to have the ability to fight for people who won't fight for you back. And that has always been your struggle. You have always went to rescue for someone that you know. You know they weren't going to pay you back. You know they weren't going to have your back. You know you, they weren't going to be there for you. That's because of who you are becoming. And for the sake of your future, you have been becoming and unbecoming since you were 12 years old. Since you were 12, the Lord hijacked you. Since you were 12, things become, began to become different. Since you were 12 years old, you begin to see that you were different. You talked different. You tried to do certain stuff, but at 16 and 17, it just didn't work for you. Even from a little girl, the Lord had you. Father, do it again. Jesus name it is so thank y'all so much I love y'all I appreciate you can we stand and just take a moment to celebrate God for the man of God prophet Jeremiah can we go ahead and give God some glory for that and can we also go ahead and praise God for the word of God today Come on, lift up your voices all over this room. Lift up your hands all over this room. And let's just begin to just give God glory for what he is doing. Even the fact that you were redeemed. We just thank him for even his presence that has been here today. As you guys leave this place, please remember to, that this week we are in prayer. I encourage everybody to come to prayer. And let's begin to just build this house in prayer. Come on, everybody, let's build this house in prayer. And let's go before the Lord real quick as we go. Father, we thank you for the word that you have released upon your people. We thank you, oh God, for what you have designed for the people that are here in this house and those that are watching on stream. Father, we just thank you for what you have deposited in all nations south, and we give you glory for it, Father God. And we thank you that all things are redeemable. And God, we go home with that word, God, that all things are redeemable. We take that to work with us. All things are redeemable. We take that, oh God, even to people we haven't talked to in a while because we did not let it go. We take it. All things are redeemable. And we thank you that when we look at ourselves, that we will see you. Father, that's all we want to do is we want to see you, Jesus, reflect it back. Let it be in our talk. Let it be in our walk. In the name of Jesus, we pray. And as we leave this place, but not from your presence, bring us back together at the appointed time. God, cover our homes, cover our, 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 us as we uh, drive in our cars. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Thank you, God. Amen and amen. As you leave this place, show a little love to somebody. Come on, go ahead. As you leave this place, show a little love to somebody, and, and we'll see you all on Wednesday evening for prayer. God bless you.